Hello and welcome, my lovely guests and dear friends. This is Ellie Barnes and this is my first video. It's an introduction video to a new school we're starting, Monasterium Allos Anthropos. So you're in the camera, you're gonna see the video. We're here live, I'll have to pay, make sure my head goes in both directions. And all the lighting is good, right, okay. And it can hear me, I've tested that. It turns out this iPhone X is one of the best filming and sound devices known to man. Mm -hmm. All right, the beginning of the school. I've worked at Hex for almost five years and I see thousands of people a year. These people have my phone number or t text number or Facebook friend messenger and they're in their beautiful souls, they always ask me a few questions a year. What would you do if you needed to study this? How do you feel about these kinds of things? How can I do more to help my own psychic experiences? Um, and so I found myself individually answering all these emails and texts on a weekly basis, and I added up that it takes me three to four hours a week to answer everyone which I do because I feel really serious about doing great work for people and not being um, a charlatan or a not, not real spiritual worker, you know? So, and then I started watching all these themes and I was like, these people are asking me the same things and I can start to really maybe consolidate what I'd like to say and build these little blogs or video chunks and give those out. So that was one side of the equation about the school, just the time thing. And then the other way that I'm trained is through the Western mystery tradition path, which really sort of crystallized and formed up in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in London in the late 1800s, where much older occult material was sort of brought together and synthesized and retranslated from libraries and begun again to be worked by a group of men and women, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And from that school, many things sprung forth in the 1900s. Dion Fortune was a main student at the end of Moyna Mathers, the wife of um, McGregor Mathers, and she trained Walter Ernest Butler, who was an English, he was trained as a medium, really. His first bit of his life was as a psychic and medium and then in the 60s, he began working with a gentleman named Gareth Knight, who was a Kabbalah scholar and, a, and an English mythology scholar. And they began writing lessons and, and downloading work from their teachers to continue to pass on this English um, magical theory, magical practice, and started a group called Servants of the Light, which is what I was trained in in the, in the 2000s. Um, they were a public group and they taught by correspondence and they taught by workshops. And Walter Ernest Butler trained Dolores Ashcroft Nowicki, who was the woman that was running it while I was a student and I went to her workshops and was trained by her material. Although Walter Ernest Butler wrote these lessons and transmitted from his inner plane teachers this path of teaching. And this, the idea is that when you begin to come into um, an, an initiatory path or when you seek deeper understanding of humanity and spiritual meaning and more high functioning as a person you uh, will connect with beings I don't I really just want to use that word lightly in other dimensions that are sort of structured and designed to be here to help us and then when you make those contacts uh, which is what it's called, you then they communicate with you directly and you kind of begin to work personally with these this strata of intelligences that um, sort of bring humanity forward. And there's a lot of uh, old, old philosophy behind this technique uh, from mouth to ear. And so the way I was trained, you did it in person and you went with a teacher who not who didn't claim, like I do not claim to be all knowing or all magnificent Oz, but someone who's done it before you and has walked up the mountain and has followed a safe, uniform, consistent method of personal development, spiritual development, and occult training, which certainly includes psychic training. There's just no way around that. Um, and then I can say to people, here's what happened to me, and this is what I looked out for, and this is the markers that helped me know I was going in the right direction. 
because I was working with teachers and people who were supervising me in my work who had also done all that. So I think it's a really nice tradition and it's a nice system and it's, it's very classic. And you can think about it in, in India or China, there'd be the guru in some sort of a cute robe sitting cross-legged and his little people would be out in front of him and he would be talking about philosophy and chanting and ideas and methods and teaching his people in person too. So that's where this is coming from, from the requests of people that would like to know more about what I do or how I work and my interplane teachers who have been guiding me for 40 years now and are pushing me to uh, probably grow the next step myself, which is to start to teach more so that I can understand more. So in a nutshell, I want to talk about, um, so that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the impulses for the Western mystery or the Western occult tradition come out of the early Middle East uh, and Egypt, written about four to 5,000 BC with you when you first have those Sumerian cuneiform tablets and you have a lot of record keeping with early writing, but you also have a lot of philosophy and magical writing because I think we at, our, at that time our mind was still observing the universe as a magical construction with gods and angels and demons and that there was some sort of hierarchy and that we needed to know and work in this system. It crystallized and formed really solidly in Egypt in 3000 BC, well, it's crystallized, but came into writing. The Hebrew Kabbalah tradition is there in ancient Egypt. The, um, the precursors to Pl Plato and Socrates and Aristotle were there in philosophy. Pythagoras was about 500 BC. Um, the library at Alexandria was started in about 350 BC and I think burned down in 300 AD. That was a really coalescing of Egyptian and Greek and Roman thinking and, and science. I mean, we were really doing some amazing things back there. We still don't know how we built the pyramids. Science today has really not given us any good answers about how we accomplished that feat. So. The, the classic theory, and it was written about by Plato, was that there really was an, Atlant an Atlantis. There was a, evolved civilizations in ancient times that were destroyed, but people had made great headway mathematically, medically, spiritually, and had been wiped out and then regrouped. So in China and in India, you have the story of the flood, you have the story of the catastrophes or the giants fighting in the skies and clashing and death and destruction. Um, over and over you have it in mythology. So I just think it's probably pretty correct. Humans have been on the earth a really long time. We've been wiped out over and over. We're probably about to go again. And what's left, what's left reconstitutes itself and tries to gather its fragments of science and knowledge and language and medicine and occult studies and then continues forward. So we pick up that thread in ancient Egypt, Babylon, Sumeria, um, Iran. That work is condensed and worked on in Alexandria, Egypt in 350 BC to 350 AD. The Roman Empire, the Greek world takes over, the Roman Empire takes over, and, and certainly the language, the mathematics, and the science, like astronomy, kept going for quite some time. But at, this, at, at the same time, 450 AD, the fall of the Roman Empire, the Catholic Church, or the Christian Church, is beginning to take over the region. And its philosophy was different than Hermetic or Kabbalistic philosophy. And they, in a nutshell, decided that they wanted to get rid of all competing philosophies and practices. And if they could rule the world, all would be good. So slowly but surely, you have it criminalized. You may not study astrology. The earth is the center of the solar system. The sun is not the center of the solar system. You may not heal with herbs. You may not predict the future. You may not help 
a woman give birth who is struggling. It's the will of God, whether she lives or not. So from about 500 AD to 1500 AD, the Catholic Church was suppressing and annihilating our spiritual and occult knowledge that we gained for thousands of years before that time period. In the East, like in India and China, that wasn't happening. The Catholic Church wasn't over there. The, the Tibetan monks, the Chinese monks, the, the Japanese Zen practitioners, they were all thriving and well and writing and teaching their systems. Yoga, think about it. It was going on 10,000 years in India before anybody over here went and said, oh wow, cool, hmm. these people are doing something really amazing with their body and their breath, and they've written about it for the last 6,000 years, which they did. The very earliest Hindu writings are about yoga, Hatha yoga. So it got interrupted and then it got revived in the Italian Renaissance in the 1500s with the de Medici family who started paying to translate Latin works out of Arabic and, and back into Latin or, or Hebrew works or old Egyptian or Coptic works. They all went to the Middle East to save themselves from the Catholic Empire. And then in the 1500s we realized they had it all and we started translating it back out of Arabic and into, into Latin and started working with it again. So it's got a really long history, the Western mystery tradition material, and uh, it just has that interruption, which is why it's harder to follow, I think, than some of the Eastern systems. So um, what is this material about? Hermes Trismegistus, who is, the, is, is Toth, who is Mercury. This is the god of magic, the god of writing. Is, is assigned multiple, multiple books called the Hermetic Material or the Hermeticum. He's not probably an individual. He's just a um, catchphrase for the style of writing. We've got Platonism and Neoplatonism, which is a style of philosophy that claims that there's a one thing that originates all life and all manifest being. And that one thing distributes itself into the many and come, becomes matter and expresses itself out through multiple dimensions and that as it is above so it is below and as it is below so it is above that there is a unity and a harmony and a, and a mathematical structure structure and an energetic structure to our universe and we can participate in it in fact we do participate in it and our brains are part of it and if they always have been, and we can connect and know the one and be more fully aware of all the mechanisms and all the patterns um, through practice and study. So Platonism and the Neoplatonism was really picked up and carried forth today as the predominant philosophy and includes alchemy. The Freemasons are hugely responsible for moving this knowledge and material around, especially because of the uh, Crusades and the Knights Templar, they were all coming from Europe, which was Catholic and frozen into the Middle East because of Israel and Jerusalem, seeing the Arabic translations, seeing the masters, the teachers, and then bringing that information back. One of the theories I've read about Baphomet, who we have in our shop and who everyone knows about as the male-female deity, is probably a bastardization of Muhammad, Muhammad, Baphomet that it was a, a hermetic symbology for alchemical union. The Arabs took it and were using the words. Then we saw it, brought it back, changed it into Baphomet, and the Knights Templar started using it as a symbol for union of polarity, or Solway a coagulate, dissolve and recombine. So the, Mace, the Freemasons, the alchemists, the Templars, the uh, crusaders were all a nice pipeline of information coming back and forth between Europe and the Middle East um, and the Rosicrucians which is what the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is it's a Rosicrucian order and Rosicrucian philosophy came about in Germany in the early 1600s it was a political and cultural movement that represented freedom of thought demographic de, uh, democratic thought, uh, the development and empowerment of man into its true form or highest being, 
um, and magical studies, including occult studies like healing and telepathy and working feats of magic. Um, so the science started to come through, understanding the mind, um, understanding uh, you know physics. 1600s, we have tarot evolving on the scene in Italy and France. Um, 1700s, 1709, I think, is the first documentation of a Freemason Lodge in Scotland. Uh, Eliphas L Levi and, and many fellow Freemasons were studying, getting their hands on these ancient texts. Uh, Plato's work, Plotinus, Agrippa, um, Paracelsus, because it was getting translated back into Latin and they could work on it again. Um, the Rosicrucians in the 1600s, yes, the Kabbalah was developing strongly in Spain through the Jewish diaspora, eight, 1700s and 1800s. The Golden Dawn came into existence in 1890. Theosophy had a good 50 year start on that, bringing a lot of information from the East, Tibet, China, India, because we were traveling. The English Empire was letting us go all over the world at that point and know and collect data from other countries. Uh, Kabbalah was coming into its own, the Ordi, Ordi Templi Orientis, Gold, uh, Alistair Crowley's group had his foothold in 1900. Um, and then all of those sciences, astrology, divination, herbalism, healing and medicine, Kabbalah studies, uh, magical ritual, gematria, language, as, as, assigning letters and numbers so that you can analyze any word in any language by a numerical value. That was a great way that they started comparing ideas between different cultures using gematria. And the flowering really began in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Books, libraries, people could travel, lodges were being formed. The, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was born out of uh, Freemasonry and Rosicrucian philosophy and some theosophy, didn't allow women in their order. Freemasons can't be women. So the strong magicians of that group said, well, this isn't right. We know we can't do good magic if we don't have polarity. Why would we limit women from studying these things? So they opened this up and they had wonderful people in the arts, writers, theater people, musicians, painters, really attracted to these kinds of orders because they could study occult science freely and with men and women and actually form lodges and form temples and do ritual and work on it however they wanted to. So from there, we have multiple orders coming out of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And we also have Wicca, Paganism, Druidry, Asatru. I mean, I can go on. I don't, I, I, it'll take me a while to think of all of them. But if you think about the proliferation of occult practices and groups today, it's overwhelming. We could spend the rest of the night making lists about all the people and all the things that are going on in the world of the occult. So what I want to switch to, so that's going on. I mean, and here in New Orleans, gosh, we've got it all. We've got voodoo. We've got conjure and hoodoo. We've got witchcraft. We've got Southern folk magic. We've got Appalachian magic. We've got French and Canadian influence magical stuff. We've got all the stuff from the American Indians and their blend with the slaves and their practice of magic. I mean, this is a fabulous city that's got everything in it and culturally really inherited it all pretty, pretty sincerely. So I see that today in the city that many of us are thriving and making a living and doing readings and we're involved in groups and it's thriving and magnificent. And the world knows if you want some really great occult stuff, go to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So what I see in all that is such a diversity of practice so many magical classes and magical training, so much psychic work and psychic training. But what I feel is missing is, is the thurgical side of the occult. And Levi and I talk about this all the time, thurgy versus thaumaturgy. Thaumaturgy is a miracle worker. This is someone who stuns you with some sort of fantastical working, 
maybe a healing, maybe an act of divination, maybe seeing where your lost shoe is and going to find it, you know, something like that. Um, what most of us practice today when we talk about just basic classic folk magic, candle magic, work at our altar, um, we're just trying to affect results on the ground. We want to do magic to, to achieve certain results, mostly for ourselves, maybe for somebody we're working for. Love, money, healing, success, gambling, get rid of your mother-in-law, what, you know, whatever you need to do. Thurgy is God working. Thurgy is ritual, meditation, path working, chanting, that asks that the God forms come down to be near you or in you and that you are elevated in your personhood to be a proper vehicle to receive the Godhead or and the God forms, and that you want to perfect yourself as the best human being you can be. It's called the great work, and it's very much overlooked and forgotten in today's occult world, that the primary thurgical magic is working on yourself, observing your personality, looking at your faults, looking at your emotions, observing how you interact with others, watching your morality, seeing how you contribute to the one. How do we give back? How do we help? How do we heal? What's the most compassionate things? And so that side of it is really getting washed away because it's not as interesting and it's not as fun as thaumaturgy. We all want to make mojo bags and do candle magic. It's cool. We are going to do that too. <laughs> but, um, Bringing the God forms down into your own human form and lift yourself towards the divine it was the purpose of occultism, initiations, mystery schools, ritual magic, uh, up until it kind of got watered down with folk magic in the 1800s. And now we have a prolif pro proliferation of magical traditions, but no underpinnings, no other kinds of training. So what I am going to do is do both. Because I'm trained in thurgy. I learned thaumaturgy from books, meeting friends, going to workshops, you know, like the localized folk magic that everyone knows how to do, candle magic, whatever, herb magic. Uh, you can get that in books, and you can get it from teachers, and you can get better at it. I don't think just learning one recipe is really the answer. If you, I believe that if you don't work on yourself and improve who you are as a being, your magic's gonna fall flat, Preach. period, period. So I like to look at it, and what I enjoy is doing it in both ways. I wanna come at it with my daily practice and my monthly practice and my yearly practice to continue to try to perfect and refine my own being. Then I have so much fun with practicing with all these other tangents in the occult because that's what we really enjoy doing, like growing the herbs and making my little dream pillows. I love doing that. Okay, so here's the Emerald Tablet. Uh, this one is translated by Isaac Newton, and this came about probably in about 300 BC in Alexandria, Egypt. And this is uh, something that I think we'll start reciting and we'll be even trying to memorize uh, together as a group. Um, because it's a beautiful, it, you could even look at it as a beautiful prayer, but it's alchemy or spiritual alchemy in a nutshell. Tis true without lying, certain and most true. That which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below to do the miracles of the one only thing. And as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation. The sun is its father, the moon is its mother, the wind hath carried it in its belly, the earth is its nurse. The father of all perfection in the whole world is here. The force or power is entire if it be converted into earth. Separate thou the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, sweetly with great industry. It ascends from the earth to the heaven, and again it descends to the earth and receives the force of things superior and inferior. By this means you shall have the glory of the whole world, and thereby all obscurity shall fly from you. 
Its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So was the world created. From this are and do come admirable adaptations, whereof the means is here in this. Hence I am called Hermes Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world, that which I have said of the operation of the sun is accomplished and ended. So this is, the cla this is a classic text, the Emerald Tablet. Um, like I said, Hermes Trismegistus was probably a figure who was a, a, a catchphrase for this time, of, this time period of writing. And the idea here is that there is a source of one that is the life force and the living, throbbing, thriving energy pattern, which perpetually sustains the, the universe. And I definitely want everyone to start thinking about that as a multiverse. You know, different dimensions, different speeds, different time periods, different kinds of beings, different colors. I view it as intermeshed, that all the dimensions are vibrating and have different qualities, but they can, they're contained in one space that this force is all of this stuff and that it is like a mathematical machine that just is. All parts are vibrating and particularized in their little spot, in their dimension for this, the creation of the world. I mean, if you have thought and spirit, you know, how do you get that into matter? I mean, this is the big discussion with Neoplatonism. How the fuck do you get it into matter? And then you've got these atoms that are all trying to express the one, but they have to be an individual atom to make up stuff with other individual atoms. So that's, I mean, that's a lot of time and that's fun. Um, but that's the basic philosophy is that what we're doing as a human is creating broader ranges of vibration in our being so that we can observe and participate in more of the universe. And maybe... Um, by practicing enough, we can open channels that maybe we could perceive or experience the one, mm -hmm. right? That's your bringing Godhead down into mm -hmm. you. So I love that. That's a great idea to think about or a way to think about. Um, thurgy, right? Not thaumaturgy, thurgy. Okay, so we're all going to be thurgists. And then here I'm switching topics again. What I want to do in this school, and what I think is really important, and what I, I've downloaded this from my inner plane teachers. In being in servants of the light, the, the primary goals would be that you would, you would have knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel, that you would connect with your own highest spiritual being, and then you'd have that as a permanent condition for education, teaching, and help, and that you would connect with that strata or stream of beings and teachers that evolve the... I'm still going to use the Western mind. That's going to be England, Ireland, Scotland, Europe, the United States, Canada, probably Mexico, and the Indian subset is in the Western mystery tradition. That'll be something we can talk about and see what we think about that idea. But it, it includes the Middle East because that's really the foundation of kind of where we got all our philosophy. Greece, I mean, you know, Turkey. Um, but excluding the Eastern and it's not because I don't think the Eastern systems are magnificent, but I think when you try to do both of them, you're cross-training in a way that's too confusing. So um, what I want to do here in, the, in my living room, which I love, is create a space where we can meet and work with the altar, um, with potentially uh, building a little bit of a temple so that we can do ritual working together. And um, that I, so I've downloaded all this stuff for my inner plane teachers and they've kept me up at night. Oh God, y'all, I haven't slept in like months. <laughs> all night, they're talking and writing and talking and writing and they keep waking me up. And if I finally doze off, they actually poke my arm and they're like, dude, no, we're not done yet. And I'm just like, I'm so done. I'm so cooked. <laughs> um, so I just can't say no to them. You know, I'll just go to the nut house if I don't do what they tell me. Um, so, so, so here's what I want to do with this live people. I would like us to keep coming and working on this process of stuff that I wanted to deliver to you. And I want us to use our altar. 
I know this is gonna, I'm gonna get up. Let's see if we can just do this. Let's see, let me just see if I can do it. Okay, so here we are, and I'm coming to the altar, and I'll put it back on there, and then we can leave it. I've got my flowers, I've got my water, I've got my light, I've got my holy water. I do have goddess and god energy on this altar. We'll probably change it later, but that will be, and this is in the east, and that will be a focus for us so that, and I'm going to put this back over here and keep talking.